Okay, so in the last module we have looked at how do you create uh, an estimated SN diagram taking into account of the correction factors and we have seen the importance of uh, application of correction factors to, to uh, calculate the uh, fatigue strength of the material or uh, where when a component is subjected to a, a certain kind of stress amplitude, the presence of correction factors uh, is very important and we have seen an example where when we apply correction factors, when we do not apply correction factor, the material which is subjected to a particular stress amplitude has uh, turns out to be safe when there is no correction factors and turns out to be unsafe when there are correction factors, all right. So, now uh, we will look at uh, fatigue failure uh, scenarios under some special circumstances. Uh, so, here uh, this is a micrograph which shows uh, the striations on the surface and please uh, note that these fatigue striations on the crack surface of an aluminum alloy. There is a spacing between the striations, there is a, a distinct spacing that one can observe uh, in these striations and that actually corresponds to the cyclic loading pattern of the system and these striations are shown at 100 or 12000 x magnification and they are not your beach marks that we have seen before. They are just the striations on the surface, okay. And they give you the signature of the kind of loading that we are having on the system, okay. And we know that the crack initiation happens due to shear stress uh, or due to shear stress that leads to slip bands and of course, the crack growth happens due to tensile stress, right. The occasional large amplitude stress cycles shows up as large striations. So, you can see this large striation they are occasional uh, increase in the stress amplitude and the small striations is around that stress amplitude you are oscillating. That means, there are occasional stress jumps are shown as the signatures of large striations. And this is one scenario that you would observe when you are looking at the failure surfaces. And another important factor that one needs to be uh, uh, worried about particularly when you are talking about fatigue crack growth is the combination of stress and corrosion. They have a synergistic effect. A material corrodes more rapidly if stressed. So, if you keep a material under a corrosive environment and if you apply a load on that then the, uh, the material corrosion get accelerated and such a phenomena is called stress corrosion cracking, okay. So, uh, we know the it is also known that the crack grows much faster if the fatigue and corrosion coexist. That means, that is called corrosion fatigue. So, the cut uh, the, the fatigue is also accelerated in the presence of a corrosive environment. So, that means, in the corrosive environment the frequency of stress slice cycling influences the crack growth rate that is very important to know. So, far we are only focusing so much on uh, the stress amplitude, but what happens to the frequency? Does the frequency influence the life of the component or the failure phenomena? It turns out that in a corrosive environment, the frequency of stress cycling plays a critical role in influencing the crack growth rate. And if the crack grows sufficiently larger such that the stress intensity factor at that particular crack length equals the fracture toughness, then the failure happens in the next tensile cycle. So, you are cycling the material at a particular cycle the crack length reaches a critical length then the next tensile cycle the fracture uh, stress intensity factor ahead of the crack tip has become equal to the fracture toughness and hence suddenly the material will fail. And such a condition is met either by increasing the crack size or by increasing the nominal stress sufficiently. Sometimes what happens you are the crack size is the same, but suddenly you have increased the nominal stress that as you have seen the large striations in the previous graph corresponds to increase in the nominal stress. That can also lead to increase in the local stress intensity factor which might be equal become equal to although the crack length did not change just by the virtue of increasing the nominal stress your crack might actually become a critical crack, okay. So, these are the features that we have already seen uh, before how a failed specimen uh, under fatigue looks like. Here in, in this figure you can clearly see that the crack is initiating here and you can see the beach line marks and then final this area being reasonably 
a very uh, smooth and then that represents the final failure. Similarly, in this figure you can see the crack initiation here and these are your beach line marks and then suddenly crack gyps through and then breaks right. So, these are the typical features that one would observe in the case of a component that fails under fatigue and usually these features are visible to naked eye. You really do not have to look under microscope, you can actually observe with our eyes. Okay, so, let me summarize the stress life approach that we have uh, discussed so far. As we have already mentioned, this is the oldest of all the three approaches. So, what are the other two approaches? The strain life approach and LEFM approach for crack growth. And this is the stress life approach is mostly used for HCF applications. That is, when the number of cycles for failure are usually expected to be more than 1000 cycles. It is a stress based model and here the stress amplitude is known the stress amplitude is known and is almost consistent for the entire range of operation. For the entire range of operation we know uh, consistently the stress amplitude. And the, in this approach the idea is to determine the fatigue strength or endurance limit of the material. We will be able to figure out that find out this, uh, this property and usually the cyclic stress that we are uh, in this approach is kept below the endurance limit to avoid failure. That is the uh, key. If you want to avoid failure you want to make sure that your cyclic stress is below the endurance limit because any stress level below the endurance limit is going to give you infinite life. And the attempts to keep local stresses in notches so that so low local stresses in notches so that the crack initiation does not occur. You should ensure that your design should be such that even if you have notches you should be able to ensure that the stresses near the notches are lower than your endurance limit so that the crack initiation does not occur or you keep the not below the endurance limit, but uh, to a very low value so that there is no local uh, crack initiation starting at those positions. And the stress life approach is based on the assumption that the strains are elastic everywhere and no plasticity whatsoever is present in the material. Okay. And we have also discussed this fatigue regimes. Once again, I am summarizing based on the number of stress or strain cycles that a part is expected to be subjected to, it is classified as a low cycle fatigue regime or high cycle fatigue regime. And we have already discussed that there is no sharp boundary between LCF and HCF, although we are saying 10 power 3 cycles, it is only a convenience, but usually it can span between 10 power 2 to 10 power 4 cycles. That is why we have taken the uh, midpoint between 10 power 2 and 10 power 4 and when we have taken 10 power 3 cycles right in a log scale and but the above number changes from material to material. Okay. So, now let us look at a more generic situation this problem gives a more uh, generic situation wherein you are given the experimental data of stress amplitude and the corresponding number of cycles to failure and how do you go about constructing an SN diagram for that right. So, some values of stress amplitude and corresponding cycles to failure are given in the table here and the tests were done on unnotched actually loaded specimens. The specimen is actually loaded not bending okay. under 0 mean stress that means fully reversed bending. If this trend seems to represent a straight line on log log plot obtain the values of A and B that is S equal to A n power B obtain the value of A and B that is the question. Okay. So, here you have this data and this is a number of cycles, but if you would plot this data on a log log plot you would see that they the, the data is not exactly following on a straight line it will be something like that. Okay. And hence as a first hand approximation what we can do is let the first point and the last point of this data this point and this point are on that straight line s equal to a n power b and then go about finding the values of a and b. So, s 1 n 1 and s 2 n 2 are the first and last point and then you have identified these values and then solve for A and B and then you figure out that A equal to 1565 MPa and B equal to minus 0.0928. And this is a first hand approximation, but what 
needs to be done in order to do a better job. The right approach is to actually fit a linear least square fit for the data and then proceed to solve for A and B. So, you have to do a regression curve fitting for the data that is provided and then figure out what is the value of A and B. So, you can actually take this data and then do a power law fit for S is equal to A n power B and then you will find out A and B. And this value of A and B is not going to be what you have found here, it is going to be a little different. But this is a reasonable estimation when you are doing it and using pen and paper rather than solving using a computer to fit the data. Okay? And now, so now that way you can actually calculate what is your A and B for any given data. Assuming that the data is fairly represented by a straight line on log log plot of stress and life diagram. And please uh, note here that you can also do a little bit a better job saying that is it does it make sense to actually consider the first point. Because we are saying that uh, the stress life approach or s equal to a n power b is best represented by is a best description in the HCF regime. And for HCF regime, we said the number of cycles to failure is at least 1000 cycles, but here it is only 222 cycles, it is definitely in LCF regime. And where S SN approach is, uh, uh, the stress life approach is not really the right approach, right. And hence, you should start actually using probably this because it is close to 1000 cycles, not exactly. And hence, instead of using 948 and 222, probably it is better to use 834 and 992 as your S1 and N1 in the work that you have done here. right? Instead of these two, you might want to use the next data point that actually is at 10,000 cycles, 1000 cycles. Okay? All right. Now, we are going to define the factors of safety for SN curves and here your, this is your stress amplitude and the number of cycles to failure. And let us say you are designing a component which is expected to experience a stress amplitude of sigma a hat and it is expected to give a design life of n hat. And let us say the material has an SN diagram like this. Okay? Then the factors of safety, we define two, two factors of safety. One is what we call safety factor in life. Another one is what is called safety factor in stress. This is something that we have already done when we are doing the static failure theories. When we are doing the fatigue failure theories, another safety factor comes in that is factor, factor, safety factor in life. That is so, on the uh, along the x axis you have life, along y axis you have stress. right? So, the factor of safety in life is given by, let us say at that particular stress amplitude, what is the number of cycles to failure? that is n f 2. So, factor of safety in life will become n f 2 by n hat. Now, if you want to try to talk about factor of safety in stress, we know that the component is designed for n hat cycles, but obviously it is not failing at that sigma hat, sigma a hat for corresponding to that. Now, what is the stress amplitude which corresponds to the failure cycles of n hat? That is, if you go vertically, sigma a 1 is the stress amplitude. If the material is subjected to that sub, uh, stress amplitude, it fails in n hat cycles, this number of cycles. So, now the stress, uh, the safe factor of safety in stress is sigma a 1 divided by sigma a hat, because at this sigma a hat, at that number of cycles, the material will not fail. But at a different stress for the same number of cycles, that is, that stress is sigma a 1, the material will fail. That means, the stress has can be increased up to sigma a 1 at the same number of cycles and still the material will not fail. right? And hence, in order to give the factor of safety in stress, it is sigma a 1 by sigma a hat. And a caution is that the safety factors in stress for fatigue, the, num the values should be in the same range as your static failure theories, which is about 1.5 to 3. Whereas, factors of safety in life are expected to be relatively large numbers 
the numbers are usually large and x n is factor of safety in life, x s is a factor of safety in stress, they are, they are anywhere beyond 5, and 20, 5 to 20 or more than that, it, sometimes it can be much larger than that also. Okay? So, usually the factors of safety in life are uh, known to be larger numbers compared to stress. That is also expected because the fatigue life is very sensitive to the value of stress because of the uh, the exponential uh, the, the power law that we have for stress life uh, relations. Okay. So, now let us look at a problem. Now, we have the previous problem where we have found the A and B values. Now, for the fatigue stress life data shown in the previous table, a stress amplitude 500 MPa is applied in a service life of 2000 cycles. So, that means, you are designing a component made of this material and that component is subjected to a stress amplitude of 500 MPa and the design life is 2000 cycles. That means, you are actually telling your customer that you can apply a stress amplitude of 500 MPa and I am giving you a design life of 2000 cycles. That means, you are not the material will not the component will not fail before 2000 cycles. Right? That is what you are telling your customer. But now, you need to know what, what are the factors of safety or this, uh, design safety factors for life and then stress for this particular component. So, how do we go about doing that? You need to calculate at this stress amplitude what is the what are the what is the value of number of cycles to failure and at the same time at this number of cycles what is the value of stress at which the material actually fails. Right? So, you can actually do that calculation by knowing A and B and then you will calculate that for 500 MPa, the material fails at 2 into 1.2.187 into 10 power cycle, 7 cycles. So, the factor of safety in life is 2.1 is N F 2 divided by N hat, N hat is the promised uh, number of cycles that is 2000 and then you see that the factor of safety in life is 109.4, there is a huge factor of safety in life. Now, I come to the stress, again you apply for the number of cycles 2000 cycles, what is the failure stress that I am calculating and that sound turns out to be 773 MPa. What is the stress amplitude, application stress amplitude, operating stress amplitude 500 MPa. So, the factor of safety in stress is 1.546. Right? So, we have a modest factor of safety of 1.546, a reasonable factor of safety in stress, but you have a very large factor of safety in life and that is typical when we are doing a fatigue design. 